When we look at serial killers, often their crimes against humanity are predetermined by a set of circumstances that they may have endured in their lifetime. In other instances, we see serial killers manipulated into carrying out bloody work, whether this be psychologically or environmentally charged. Some serial killers kill because it satisfies a hunger inside of them, whether this be a mental stimulant or perhaps even a sexual one. There's also cases of serial killers being psychopaths and that they are not affected by the emotional consequences of their actions and are apathetic to the pain that their victims sustain. This leads me to talk about an unorthodox serial killer, one who isn't traditionally remembered as a serial killer per se, despite very much fitting the profile. The exact number of her kill count is not known, though her exploits indicate that many slaves had indeed died by her hands, most likely in an ominous sounding room that sat at the top of a two-story mansion. Reports have it that they were found mutilated, butchered, and even experimented on. Like many women of New Orleans history, Madame La Laurie was a prominent woman who frequented the social scene that was riddled with gossip, rumors, the spilling of political secrets, and endless drama. She was known as a distinguished figure, one who was central to exclusive cocktail parties, private balls, and extravagant galas. Prior to the ghostly crimes that she would go on to commit, La Lori was described as being courteous, charming, and intensely beautiful. She was born on March 19th in 1787, with the name Marie Delphine McCarthy, to two well-established members of the New Orleans Creole community. Her childhood does not seem to have been significantly documented, but given the status of her parents, we can only assume that she lived quite a comfortable, well-content life. She only begins to really appear in records after her first marriage in the year 1800 to Don Ramon, a high-ranking Spanish royal officer whom she would travel to Spain with in 1804. Given the dates of her marriage, it would appear that La Lori was only 13 years old of the day of her wedding. The marriage wouldn't work out though, and by June 1808, Delphine would marry to a prominent banker, merchant and lawyer named Jean Blanc. Blanc went as far as to purchase a house at 409 Royal Street for her, which would later be known as Villa Blanc. She would give birth to four children and would seem content to live in her big house with all its comforts. That is until Blanc died in 1816, just eight years after their wedding. Delphine wouldn't marry again until almost 10 years later, where in 1825, she married her third husband, a doctor named Leonard Lalaurie who was much younger than she was. You can argue that Delphine may have genuinely loved all three of her husbands, though it's interesting to note that her husbands all had one thing in common. They were pretty loaded. In 1831, La Lorie had bought a property at 1140 Royal Street, which she managed in her own name, with little assistance from her husband at all. I suppose this in itself dismisses the idea that Delphine was something of a gold digger, that even though she had her husband's resources at her disposal, she did more than just live a life of leisure. She organized a two-story mansion to be built on this land and even created an annex for slaves to live in. She would set up herself, her husband, and two of her daughters to live there, where they can serve the central location in New Orleans society. It's here we begin to delve into the darker side of La Lorie's life and the more sinister backdrop of New Orleans' history. As I mentioned, La Lorie would have a slave quarters installed in the house, and it's through these slaves that she would earn her reputation as a sadistic torturer and murderer. Her treatment of her slaves between 1831 and 1834 had mixed descriptions. Harriet Martineau, a British social theorist at the time, would describe La Lorie's slaves as being haggard and wretched in appearance. Although, La Lorie would seem to treat them with kindness and respect and would be solicitous of their health and needs. Court records even indicate that La Lorie would have freed two of her slaves. Martineau would continue to write that there were notable rumours in the streets of New Orleans about La Lorie's abuse of her slaves and that it had reached such a pinnacle that a local lawyer would be dispatched to investigate. 
During his investigation, though, the lawyer didn't seem to find anything amiss. So why were these rumours circulating? Was it perhaps just common tripe spread by those who were envious of Ladori's success? Or was there perhaps a more insidious truth to the tale? There appears to be an infamous account, one also cited by Martineau, that there was a 12-year-old girl named Leah who was one day brushing Lalori's hair, only to hit a snag. Lalori was said to be so infuriated that she grabbed a whip and chased the young slave girl up to the roof. So afraid of being beaten, the young girl was said to try and escape her punishment by leaping from the roof of the Royal Street Mansion. Whether or not she had actually leapt to escape her punishment, or because she'd been pushed, or because she'd simply lost her footing, is unknown. But it is a tragedy nonetheless that one woman's anger led a small girl to her demise. The body of Leah was said to be buried on the mansion grounds, but one rumour has it that Lalori took the girl's body and simply dumped it in the well. The incident wouldn't go unnoticed though, Lalori would be investigated under the allegation that she was illegally enforcing grievous harm upon her slaves. It would force Lalori to forfeit nine of her slaves as a fine for the misconduct. Although, most regrettably, these slaves were actually brought back by a relative of Lalori and then put straight back to work in the household. Lalori wouldn't learn her lesson though, and instead of reflecting on how she could better treat the slaves, she chained the cook to the kitchen stove. It was said that in one instance, her daughters recognised her wrongdoings and tried to free the slaves, but were severely beaten thereafter for their efforts. It wasn't until a fire broke out on April 10th in 1834 that we begin to see just what Lalori was hiding. The fire would ruin most of the mansion and everyone was forced to be evacuated. When the fire marshals got there, however, they found the cook, a 70-year-old woman who was still tied to the stove by her ankle. She was able to survive the fire, miraculously, and would go on to say that she was the one who had started the fire in the first place, in an attempt to kill herself, because she feared being punished at the hands of Lathori. It was understood that slaves were taken to the uppermost level of the mansion and were then never seen again. It's been noted that bystanders on the day of the fire tried to help out and would try to enter the slave quarters to rescue them. However, La Lori refused to grant them the keys in order to access the room. Therefore, bystanders were forced to burst down the doors themselves, but what they found would have had them beckoning slowly away. It was a sight none of them could prepare for. Seven slaves, or so they say, who were more or less horribly mutilated suspended by the neck, limbs stretched and torn, some of which had the palpable stench of death. Amongst those found were slave women wearing iron collars and an elderly woman who had received a large untreated gash to her head that may have contributed to her inability to walk. A newspaper at the time, known as the New Orleans Bee, stated that all of the victims were found naked and that those who were not found strapped to tables were instead chained to the walls. It goes on to say that some had their stomachs sliced open and that their intestines would have been wrapped around their waists. One woman in particular was said to have her mouth wielded open, where feces had been stuffed inside. Her lips were then sewn shut. One man who was hung in shackles was said to have a wooden spoon protruding from his head which had been placed in a hole that had been drilled into his skull. Some say that the use of the spoon was to stir his brains. Other accounts suggest that the slaves had their bones broken numerous times and set in unnatural positions so that they healed incorrectly. One woman was said to have her bones and limbs rearranged so that she moved like a crab. Others were supposedly coated with honey and black ants. It's important to note that whilst many of these tales are horrific and ghastly to even comprehend, not many of them have actually been certified. For example, an account about male slaves having their eyes gouged out, their fingernails ripped out from the root, their joints skinned, and great holes carved into their flesh, is written by a writer named Jean Delavine in 
ghost stories of old New Orleans in 1946, but she simply has no basis for her claims. She would state that she had obtained her information from old newspaper interviews and from word of the neighbors. She also noted that the workmen who went about rebuilding the mansion after the fire had uncovered skeletons beneath the structure and that the authorities would declare that these were indeed slaves that had been buried there to hide the fact that they had been killed inside of the property. Other claims seem to be embellished from this version by Delavine, where elaborate forms of horrible torture are suggested, including the supposed medical experiments. But they are never actually sourced to any historical documentation or contemporary. There also exists the compelling argument that Lalaurie had no reason to commit to medical experimentation, as well as the fact that it was never actually mentioned in print until almost a hundred years later in published works by people who weren't even in New Orleans at the time. The extent of Lathorley's crimes against her slaves have not and will not probably ever be fully known to us, but it's up to you whether you believe someone of her position was capable of treating another human being in this way, given that such gruesomeness is seemingly unwarranted. After all, the men and women who were said to have been found in the room on the top floor of the mansion were simply slaves and couldn't possibly have deserved such a revolting demise. Therefore, it leads me to consider that if these allegations against Lalori are true, then she is indeed nothing short of evil. When questioned about the slaves, Lalori's husband Leonard would simply reply that other people ought to mind their own business. More notes from British theorist Martineau state that the slaves may have been flayed forced into uncomfortable postures and wore spiked collars that kept their heads from being able to move freely. This furthermore contributes to the idea that Lalori did indeed mistreat her slaves. Whether she mistreated her slaves to the extent that suggested is neither here nor there, but Martineau is something of a contemporary source given that she was physically there in New Orleans at the time and therefore has more legitimacy in her claims, at least I think so, as opposed to the writers who would echo her sentiments a century later. But why did Lalaurie mistreat her slaves at all? Some are quick to point out that she was simply a nasty racist, and perhaps they're correct. Others state that her disdain for her slaves stems from the fact that her male relatives, including her own father, were said to have mistresses and secret affairs with black women. Again though, it is just another question that we will likely never know the answer to. When the general public found out about the diabolical treatment of the slaves, they rushed to the residence and destroyed everything in which they could get their hands on. They were said to cause so much damage to the property that by the end, scarcely anything remained but the walls. If you thought the slaves were about to get the freedom that they rightfully deserved though, you'd be wrong. They were taken into police custody and put up for public viewing like cattle, which attracted an audience of almost 4,000 people. I imagine that many people would think that this is the part where Lalori and her husband were apprehended by the authorities and thrown into jail for such grievous body harm. But after the 1834 fire, Lalori seems to simply fade out of the city of New Orleans altogether. Martineau believed that Lathori had fled the scene with her husband in order to escape the mob that would storm her mansion and would travel to Paris, where she is said to have lived the rest of her days, scot-free no less. Beyond that, little is actually known about her. It seems clear that she had escaped justice given that her name does not appear in any court record, nor was she ever recorded by any contemporaries after the fire and the destruction of her mansion. A popular account indicates that Lori was killed whilst involved in a hunting party where a wild boar was able to maul her to death. Another story suggests that she returned to New Orleans but incognito and assumed a new life as a commoner or at least as someone who didn't throw lavish parties and bask in the limelight. While this idea is generally dismissed by historians, there is one damning bit of evidence to suggest that she did indeed returned to New Orleans. While there are records that show she did in fact die in 1849, 
a solemn and humble plaque was discovered in the late 1930s in St. Louis Cemetery in none other than New Orleans. The plaque read, Madame Lalaurie, born Marie Delphine McCarthy, died in Paris December 7th, 1842. While we may never know the exact cause of her death, nor what her life looked like after she fled from New Orleans, Madame Delphine Lalaurie remains a fascinating figure, perhaps made all the more fascinating by the fact she was once a high-profile figure, one who was accused of something so terrible, only to fade away into the fog of history. Tell me below what you thought about the legend of Delphine Lalaurie. What do you think drove her to committing these atrocities in her name? Do you think that everything you've heard about the torture of slaves is true? Or has the truth been stretched a little bit? Do you think that she came back to New Orleans after her escape to Paris? And if so, why do you think she came back? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button. Until the next time guys.